Hello everyone. I hope you can hear me. Okay, all right. Well, uh, good evening folks uh, and good morning to those who are abroad. I hope you can hear me. All right, okay. <clears throat> well, today I'm going to be speaking about intelligence and the new warfare uh, since 9-11. Okay, all right. I hope everyone is uh, joining in. I would appreciate if you can um, send in your comments or any questions. Uh, I'll be more than happy to help you or give you some comments. Okay, all right. Okay, let's just go ahead, all right? So, uh, the definition of intelligence, uh, I'm going to quote from the Oxford Dictionary. The practice of intelligence has been around, okay, for around 100 years. The ability to gain and apply knowledge and skill uh, and secret information collected about the enemy or competitor. Unquote. Okay, so this is the Oxford Dictionary definition. And also, uh, one of the authors, Khan, uh, he puts it this way. I define intelligence in the broadest sense as information. So what he's saying is, it's a collection of information, uh, which he defines intelligence okay right okay thank you for your likes guys I appreciate it and uh, yeah thanks for joining in okay let me just give you a brief history uh, of what is intelligence and the new warfare that I'm actually telling you about so the evolution of intelligence has a historical narrative okay um, since the time of hunter-gatherers who used intelligence to hunt for their food to survive in the new world, okay, where there, were, there was no high technology or farming and agriculture. Uh, so you're talking about, you know, refrigerators, restaurants, microwaves, uh, whatever you call it. Uh, instead, they depended entirely on nature and they used the resources to exchange gifts food, fur, and weapons among each other tribes and seafarers. For example, uh, let me give you a brief account on um, America. The native Indians traded fur to beaver pelts with the Dutch, English, and the French, right? So there was a lot of beaver trade as well, if you actually study American history a little bit. And the exchange of goods and information is essentially the same concept, I, I would say that. Uh, when they hunted, they were essentially gathering information from about the locations that they were. Uh, the time they come about in the open fields to graze uh, and graze the grass and so on. So in order for them to kill and capture these animals, these hunter-gatherers used these primitive weapons and tools along with their intelligence to hunt successfully. So what we're seeing here is we're seeing an ancient form of intelligence. Whereas, uh, if you put it in today's perspective, uh, you would say, you know, intelligence based on telecommunication, um, cyber warfare, um, well, codes, uh, decoding, right? Then you have, uh, you know, hacking and you have, you know, telephones, uh, which I will get back to you a little bit later uh, regarding 9-11. Uh, and so many, so many things, uh, so many new technology that uh, we are, you know, we're, um, we're facing right now, right? So, do, so let me just uh, go back a little bit. During the ancient times in Egypt, okay, uh, people like Ramses II, uh, yeah, Ramses II, along with his people, were able to locate his enemy's army by defeating the prisoners of war, okay? So similarly in history, right? 
you have the Egyptian history as well, and uh, you also have the you know Israel's history as well, and Israel's military campaigns. Uh, if you do read the book of uh, Joshua, uh, Joshua was a leader. Okay, he led the people of the nation of Israel. Right, uh, he, he was up against more than thirty men, thirty enemies um, during his time. So thirty army enemies sorry one of his first mission was to take possession of the land of jericho okay the book of joshua points out that uh so this is in the book of joshua chapter 2 verse 1 and i quote he sent out two men from from acacia grove to spy secretly uh going i'm sorry saying go view the land especially jericho right uh, so they went about and came to the house of harlot named uh, Rahab and lodged there, unquote. So this is in the Bible, uh, if you actually uh, read the book of Joshua. It talks about a spy. And, you know, these spies were sent out to find more information uh, regarding the land and the people of Jericho. So, you know, the, so that the Israelites would come and conquer the land of Jericho, right? And the story goes that Rahab had made an oath, right? with the two spies that she's you know that she would help them and escape when uh, when there was a trouble that persisted then when the time came for the people of israel to attack jericho rahab and her family would be spared because of her oath to give crucial information okay so what did i say about the definition of uh, intelligence is information right and the protection obviously uh, to the two agents who represented the israel Okay, represented Israel. So, uh, I think you get the gist of the historical narrative of uh, what is the definition and what are, um, you know, the, the occurrence of intelligence uh, and the community during that time. All right, okay. Okay, so in USA, okay, I said I'm going to talk to you about 9-11. So, in the USA, um, the main intelligence community comprises of number one cia central intelligence agency right and number two which is the fbi federal bureau of investigation and um nsa national security agency so these are the three main um inter, you know intelligence community uh, based in us and then you have in uh, india so in india India has a number of intelligence uh, agencies, of which the best known are, number one, the Research and Analysis Wing, okay? Then you have India's External Intelligence Agency and the Intelligence um, Bureau, the Domestic Intelligence Agency, right? Uh, you have responsible for counterintelligence, counterterrorism, and overall internal security, right? So. Uh, the UK also has a couple of uh, agencies too, I think, but the main organizations are Secret Intelligence Services, which is called SIS or uh, MI16. Uh, I don't know if you can hear my cat here, but my cat is here. Um, well, the, the security services uh, MI5 is also uh, quite prevalent. Uh, the Government Communications Headquarters, GCHQ, and the Defense Intelligence, right? DI. Uh, let me call my cat once, all right? Hold on. Hey, buddy. Hey, buddy. Hey, buddy. All right, okay. I think this is the first time that my cat is live here. Hey, buddy. Look here. See? 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 All right, okay. You want to go? Get out of here. Okay, okay. All right, sorry about that. Uh, that was my friend. Okay, so I told you about the U.S., U.K., and India intelligence community and its agencies, right? So uh, let me just go ahead and delve into uh, the 9-11, okay, that I was going to talk to you about. So in September 11, 20, uh, 201, uh, 2001, the United States was uh, under attack by uh, an airplane filled with gallons of fuel and passengers. Okay, yeah, this was a seri serious attack which was plotted out carefully by Islamic terrorist groups called Al Qaeda. Al Qaeda, okay, uh, who was an alliance with uh, the Taliban. Okay, the attacks resulted in the collapse 
of the north and the south tower okay so which is the twin towers okay you have the north and the, you have the north and then you have the south okay either way uh, right after the twin tower collapsed the plane crashed into the western block okay of the Pentagon so Pentagon was the second one I think uh, and then the third one uh, another airplane crashed in the fields of Pennsylvania okay so overall I think that uh, overall there was four incident that had killed and injured uh, many people okay according to the report okay so I actually dug out a little bit of uh, data regarding how many people died and all that kind of stuff so I dug out from the National Commission of, on terrorist attacks upon the United States so there's an article um, I think it's in the government uh, website it pointed out that more than 2,600 people died at the World Center, okay, World Trade Center. 125 died at the Pentagon. 256 died on the four planes, okay. So, you know, in a sense, okay, these deaths uh, surpass the Pearl Harbor. I mean, you know, it's a, it's a tragic event, and I think, um, you know, this needs a little bit of a you know analysis uh, from scholars and you know just regular people uh, we have to know what you know uh, what happened and maybe we can um, avoid it I think you know so, so one of the reasons why I'm actually doing this podcast is uh, you know I think diplomacy is also part and parcel of uh, intelligence and uh, warfare okay so uh, you know diplomacy would not have been uh, existing had it not there been warfare and peace okay at the end of the day so uh this is kind of like you know uh in conjunction with uh, what i've been doing uh, ever since i started my podcast so another reason why i think it's important for us to delve into such topics is that um, you know uh, when there's a failure uh, of intelligence I think uh, we kind of tend to become a little bit more vigilant and I think that's a good thing um, okay all right you know the failure in, in collection and analysis okay usually um, what the intelligence community do is they collect data they collect and, and now you know analyze uh, so that they can process uh, for further um, you know uh, things that uh, you know that needs you know analysis I suppose so according to uh, I was I was kind of reading a uh, Angelo code Villa okay he's kind of like an author here he points out that uh, I quote for many intelligence boils down to getting basic facts about geography political institutions armies uh, economics facts about who is doing what at uh, you know particular given time and technical facts about the features of machines uncode okay so uh, by the way I'm going to put all my uh, resources and my citations um, below down below the comment so that yeah if you're interested you can look into it okay uh, all right okay so uh, the failure in the use of effective technology and application uh, to counter terrorism had uh, definitely a big flaws I think uh, within the intelligence community the NSA and CIA did not communicate well okay which narrowed the chances to counter al-Qaeda prior to 9-11 in the 2003 Iraq war. Uh, the CIA officers who were stationed abroad relied heavily uh, on a particular phone, I think I was telling you about, which is called uh, Turaya phone in 2003, okay? Turaya phones were like, you know, the very chunky ones um, and the satellite phones which was used prior to uh, Nokia phones, I think. So Turaya phones in 2003 were used to communicate on the ground during the launch uh, of Operation uh, Iraq Freedom. Okay, that was a term after, for for the war uh, or pre-war, I suppose. After most uh, other communication lines were destroyed or interrupted during the invasions. These were some of the phones that were available from 2000 to 9-11, like I said, you know, Turaya is a satellite system phone, okay. You know, actually this phone covered a lot of ground, uh, all across Middle, Middle East, I think, 
yeah, Europe, Asia, and Africa. Um, so, you know, the NSA, the, you know, was also known for breaking into satellite communications, which normally it's it's a given fact uh, among you know international community and agencies. Uh, you know, Khalid Al Mindar, okay, who was among the hijackers of 9/11, was staying in San Diego, uh, who had used the same Tarai phone, okay, to communicate with Al Qaeda members, uh, Al Qaeda members domestically, okay, and internationally. So he was using the phone as if it was a his phone, you know, without any security. You know, ironically, I think Osama. I don't. I'm not saying I think he did. Okay, Osama bin Laden also used this phone to plan the operation in Yemen and Afghanistan too. Okay. It is also reported that the agency, okay, the agency had all the technical uh, technical uh, operations, okay, even before the year 2000, okay, we're talking about uh, before 9-11. Uh, had the collection agency made the effort to trace and analyze their phones, um, their calls, recordings, um, and decoding their text messages or uh, just regular messages, you know, voicemails and stuff like that, uh, and even tracking locations too, I think, uh, then the agency could have prevented 9-11, okay? Um, indeed, the collection and in that analysis carried out by NSA and other intelligence communities struggled to face the challenge during its time, which is why you know, 9-11 happened, okay, unfortunately. So another failure uh, of, you know, intelligence that took place was management and leadership, okay. So why I'm saying failures is because had it not been a failure, we would not have 9-11, okay, uh, as simple as that. But uh, we're trying to analyze the failures so that we don't make mistakes again, okay. Uh, a problem could be the change of FBI directors, okay? So, you know, FBI and CIA um, usually, they work pretty much uh, very separately before, uh, but I'll get into it. I think that's one of the uh, lapses. Uh, so the change of FBI directors uh, took place seven days before 9-11, okay? This is very important because uh, Louis Freak, okay, F R E E H, uh, who was the fifth director of the uh, FBI from September, uh, you know, September 1993 to uh, June 2001. So there was a there was a change, okay. The next in line was Robert Mueller, okay, who took office. Um, as the sixth, okay, so the fifth was there, and then they have the sixth director of the FBI uh, in September 4, 2001. Okay, so, you know, there's this kind of a, a, a lapse of dates as well, which is, you know, which didn't go very well, I think, with the coordination plan. So, um, one could argue that this was, you know, a timing and change of leadership problem, I think. Uh, the senior officials of the FBI and the CIA usually collaborate, okay, uh, in intelligence sharing and in investigation works despite some setbacks, okay. As a bystander, okay, the changes of the FBI director seven days before 9-11 is something that spells for uh, uncertainties. Uh, obviously, like I said, you know, um, if there's a change in government or administration or you know even a regime, uh, obviously you're going to face uh, a lot of communication uh, gaps and so on and so forth. So therefore, the blunder. Okay. Uh, so there's another one who was the director of Central Intelligence, uh, George Tenet. Okay, who was well informed of the counterterrorism efforts. Okay, so he was well versed. Um, by his fellow CIA intelligence officials and uh, deputy director uh, John E. McLaughlin, okay, so they, they were kind of like uh, working together during that time. You know, for example, uh, th this is one incident that incident that happened, uh, which needs a little bit of uh, analysis here because 
In one of the speeches that made by, that was made by De Deputy General of the Central Intelligence, uh, Mr. John, again, uh, in August, okay, 21st, 2001, okay, um, at the Fort Annual Space and Missile Defense Conference, Huntsville, Alabama. So in Alabama, he did a speech, okay, and this is what he said. So the ICBMs are a point of spectrum of means that include missiles, cruise missiles, and guess what? Aircraft, he even said aircraft, okay? So this is very important, okay? They already had this uh, intelligence from before, but uh, you know, unfortunately. Then you had short range, okay? You have missiles on ships, then you had truck deliveries, suitcase weapons, uh, et cetera, et cetera. You know, some of these, men uh, I mean sorry some, some of these were meant uh, you know sort of a to you know detonate or you know kill people I suppose you know uh, or whatever the agenda was okay so unlike the ballistic missiles okay some of these means such as crude suitcase weapons are not necessarily preserves of states okay they're more the instruments of a pure chair than the turns of course of diplomacy uh, so basically uh, you know these were active you know terrorists who were plotting to kill basically okay this shows okay that the intelligence community right and policymakers were aware of the dangers but struggled to stop the terrorists of 9-11 okay uh, the director also received constant updates to track Osama bin Laden and was responsible for arming threats to various groups to the US military, the Congress, the policymakers, uh, the public and other foreign counterparts for um, better teamwork. So, you know, these guys were trying, okay. Um, so another problem I think that came up during my research was uh, the structural, you know, problems uh, among the intelligence community in uh, America. The FBI, okay, uh, faced a big structural, pro you know, problem uh, on two fronts, okay. First was externally. So basically, uh, the, you know, the FBI was caught in an intelligence community that artificially, artificially divided intelligence responsible by geography, okay, leaving huge gaps in coverage, all right. The CIA and other agencies were responsible, okay, um, for tracking terrorists abroad while the FBI was supposed to watch uh, at home, okay. So, you know, CIA was abroad and FBI was, uh, you know, at home. So I think these two clashed uh, during that time. And, you know, there was a division of agency task, I think, uh, both abroad and domestic. And, you know, it could sometimes lead <laughs> to different problems instead of one single problem. Uh, so the FBI was not paying much attention to the international uh, tra or transnational uh, terrorism intelligence per se, uh, whereas the other agencies like the CIA never accepted <laughs> the FBI as a part of the joint operation, which is uh, very sad, I think, um, because you know there was, a def there was definitely a big communication gap, I think. So this, without a doubt, gave way for terrorists uh, to, uh, you know, to come in between the two tangled, uh, uh, tangled up agencies and uh, did what they had to do. Okay. So the FBI during the 1990s uh, was a single agency. Okay. That comprised of 56 loosely connected agencies. Okay. Like I said, in India as well, uh, th there's a multiple agencies. Okay each of which uh, sets its own principles, okay, assign its own personal uh, personal gains or, you know, agents, ran its own cases, okay, followed its own orders and guarded its own information. I think about the FBI every time I think about, you know, certain uh, crime movies or something like that, um, and crime, uh, you know, series, whatever, in Netflix or uh, documentaries, but, um, yeah, I think they were busy doing what they had to do, you know, snooping around, um, you know, the streets of New York or, you know, California, Los Angeles or uh, Arizona, wherever it is, 
so there was no urgency and seriousness in efforts to counter transnational terrorism, okay? So, uh, you know, I think there was also a sort of a traditional structure within the FBI during the 1990s, certainly, which was problematic, okay, for, for, for them to counter terrorism and finding international terrorist suspects, okay? Uh, the FBI, FBI also admitted, okay, that the, the, the traditional field, okay, office had failed to counter terrorists during 9-11, all right? The information was funneled into a stovepipe where individuals, officers, perceived their own cases. Like I said, you know, they did not bother much about, you know, national priorities of counterterrorism and so on and so forth. So there was like a definitely a traditional structure which, uh, which failed basically. Uh, and let's talk about failed encounters briefly, okay. Uh, during May 2001, okay, Kenneth Williams, who was the FBI agent, uh, had stumbled upon an alarming pattern of Islamic extremists enrolling in the Arizona flight schools. So there was a flight school basically in Arizona, okay, uh, where, you know, students uh, or, you know, anyone who wants to sign up for, um, you know, training for, for flying, okay. Uh, while undertaking one of his assignments on counterterrorism in Phoenix, okay, this was in Phoenix, guys, by the way. Uh, his interview with one of them had revealed that the room, uh, you know, the person who was, uh, you know, who was the suspect, his room had posters of Osama bin Laden and suspected, uh, you know, that. You know, he was essentially, you know, kind of like um, one of the, you know, hijackers. And apparently he was, but, you know, I'll, so hear me out here, okay? So while he sent these memos to the FBI, he later got warning reports back, okay? This incident gave him clues that Osama bin Laden was sending students to enroll in civil uh, civil classes, aviation classes, and univers in universities in Phoenix in preparation for 9-11 uh, attacks, okay? So basically, these, um, these people were going to aviation colleges and universities uh, in order for them to fly. <laughs> you know, unfortunately, okay, this case was not further investigated during its time. So, yeah, there you go. There's another, like, uh, you know, rat in the hole, I suppose, right? So um, another suspect, okay, who was training in the same uh, flight schools in Phoenix was Hani Hanjour, okay. I hope I pronounced it right. Hani Hanjour. It is believed, okay, by the FBI that the two of them started their aviation course in 1997 until 2000. Well, that's a long time. I think that's about three years of, you know, like full on, like, you know, doing... <laughs> Uh, aviation courses and these were the ones who actually did bomb you know the the world trade you know so obviously you know I'm pretty sure they lost track of these guys okay uh, then the, the there's hey here's another encounter okay uh, his name is Zacharias uh, Mosawi okay I hope I pronounced it right uh, he was a Moroccan descent uh, probably French, who, who spoke French, and he was a French citizen, I think, because <laughs> most of the friends that I've met from Morocco uh, or from that part of the region speak uh, French, I think, yeah. So, he was the only person convicted within the U.S. who was pleaded guilty of six counts of conspiracy to com commit treason, um, treasonary acts against 9-11, okay? Well, guess what happened, okay? He was sentenced to life prison in 2006, which was after 9-11, okay? This was not a failure of counterterrorism, but a matter of timing, I think. Uh, you know, because many radical Islamic terrorists were busy plotting inside the United States, so on. So, whatever it is, like, he was, like, he was caught and all that stuff, but it was not only him. There was a lot, okay? Uh, there was a bunch of them who were, you know, traveling across, visa, traveling across, you know, the Atlantic and, uh, you know, they had their visas and all that stuff, and passport, all agreed and all that. So, you know, ma many radicalists, okay, 
uh, I would say terrorists, okay, were they were plotting, okay, <laughs> they were plotting uh, in the uh, aviation colleges and so on and so forth. Uh, daylight, okay, and uh, you know, I suppose like you know, this is one of the problems that you know the FBI uh, were slack were you know slacking off. I think. So in conclusion, okay, uh, the war on terrorism, hmm, I think this is a very important thing because uh, it's a current issue as well and it's also a historical issue, um, but it's, it's an ongoing battle, okay, all around the world. Uh, according to Ryan, okay, I'm going to quote Ryan again from uh, one of the articles that I've read and uh, I'm going to put the link down below. He says that underlying causes of terrorism remain beyond scrutiny, okay? And the threat is largely manufactured and packaged in the language of good and evil. Indeed, as long as the consensus uh, of an American supremacy of values goes unchallenged, the United States will march into new battles against new enemies. There you go, unquote. So, you know, the, the, there's a complexity to it of the changing political environment as we see today, uh, where, you know, regimes, governments, um, terrorist groups, presidents and leaders are, you know, they're changing every five to ten years and some are even changing in two years uh, or one year, I think. You know, one of the main causes of 9-11 attacks were the overall fa failures of uh, responding to changes and communications and uh, in a timely manner and you know encounters were which were left uh, cold um, so you know one of the main causes I think of the 9-11 attacks were the overall failures uh, to respond and act together okay uh, in a timely manner again by the by the US intelligence community and uh, well, I wish they had help, you know, from other uh, countries too. But uh, you know, that was not in the radar, I think. Uh, and policymakers as well, and the ongoing political crisis during the 1990s and 1911. Um, so, in a sense, okay, this is one of the problems that uh, you know countering terrorism does is that. Uh, you know, when when there's less intelligence, when people are not deliberate, when the community, intelligence community is not watchful, I think it tends to, you know, give way to a lot of loopholes, which causes uh, events like 9-11, uh, or the bombing in France, you know, or, well, yeah. So, hmm. So, the definition of, you know, what is a terrorist and what is a, a militant group could be kind of like in parallel, I think. Uh, so, why I say this, okay, because, oh, by the way, before I say about this, okay, let me just uh, put this in perspective here. One of my friend, I I did a presentation in UK. When I was in UK, I was studying for my master's uh, in diplomacy, at, and uh, he was a British Pakistani. Okay, and we did this together uh, for our presentation uh, regarding the intelligence, the failure of intelligence in uh, the United States, per, you know, pertaining to 9/11. And he, you know, basically what he said was that. Um, he argued that the U.S. was sponsoring um, terrorism, okay? Why? Because, um, you know, the Taliban had met Ronald Reagan in the Oval Office in 1983. I think that the, the picture is also there in Google. I, I don't know, don't get me if it's, the, if, if it's, you know, legitimate picture, but he showed me, okay? So the Taliban met Ronald, Ronald Reagan in the Oval Office in 1983, okay? Um, the CIA camps all across trained Mr. Obama, Mr. Bin Laden, sorry, Mr. Bin Laden, uh, fellow Bin Laden's fellow guerrilla 
uh, armies. There you go. So the CIA camps were there to train uh, all these, uh, you know, Taliban terrorist groups and jihadis, I think. And, you know, this was, I think, this was a failure and a lack of, lack of, uh, you know, forward thinking, I think, you know, uh, what could have, what they have created, you know, could have been prevented, I think. So, yeah, so there you go. That's, that's one of my experiences, I think. But, you know, hey, I cited for, um, you know, analyzing the, the failures of the CIA, FBI and all that. And, and I kind of cited for, you know, America. So anyways, so, uh, like I said, you know, here's here's my you know personal point of view. Okay, uh, this is totally out of the context, but uh, not out of context, but out of uh, you know uh, authors and citations and all that stuff. So, you know, when we think about um, you know terrorism and you know militant groups and uh, you know extremist groups, uh, well, terrorists exactly. So in any nation, okay, I was just thinking, uh, when the government is working hand in mouth uh, with, uh, say, a militant group or uh, a terrorist extremist group, directly or indirectly, then there is no law, there is no order within the nation, okay, or a state, okay. It's a lost cause, I would say, a failed state. You know, it only seeks power without any form of accountability, uh, without any form of meritocracy, okay, or without any principles of statecraft. Uh, you know, as the saying goes, right, they're playing the fiddle to the tune, okay. So how would you just imagine, okay, if... if so, for example, if you see it in Afghanistan, what's happening out there? We can see that in Afghanistan where the Taliban had taken over the government, okay? It's a militant group. I would say it's a militant, it's a terrorist group, okay? But, you know, uh, well, they say they're, um, they're, you know, legitimate government or whatever. But uh, I don't see any, you know... <laughs> any uh, you know similarities or any accountability or credibility to that but so one of the problems that happens when you know a group like that takes over the government okay you lose jobs okay Afghanistan right now according to the United Nations they lost 500,000 jobs okay as and when they took the you know, government okay it was a coup, basically. I don't know if it's a coup or... Uh, it was, you know, forceful, okay, I think. Uh, there was a lot of assassinations. There was a lot of, um, you know, um, very brutal things that happened when they tried to topple the government, okay? So, uh, which I don't... I don't like, uh, you know, uh, war. Neither do I like uh, all this, you know, taking over by the military the militant groups and all that when there's a when there's a civil government taking you know functioning okay so anyways uh one of my actually one of my, the hear me hear, hear me out one of my postures okay he pointed out that there is no good war okay and there is no bad peace okay i thought that was kind of a very interesting but anyways guys i hope you like my podcast um and feel free to uh, comment down below. All right, so I'll see you guys in my next podcast. All right.